Well, we're right here in the beginning of a sermon series titled, The Most Important Story You've Never Been Told. And last week, we began with this idea that in the first century, people found Jesus irresistible. If you were to pick up one of the Gospels, one of the four accounts of the life of Jesus and start reading, something that you would encounter quite early in the story is that wherever Jesus went and to whomever he talked to, there was crowds of people who found him irresistible. And there was individuals who were so drawn to Jesus that they made major changes in their lives. There was something about his confidence, something about his conviction, something about his compassion, something about the way that he taught that was different than the way that others taught. And this made him irresistible to crowds of people almost everywhere he went. It's also true, though, that there was a few that found Jesus to be intolerable. And it wasn't simply his popularity, although that was a factor. Rather, this small group, they understood something about Jesus that we often miss. That Jesus, he wasn't trying to improve Judaism as it was in the first century. He didn't come to just simply reform the temple structure and the sacrificial system and all the things that this small group that found Jesus intolerable held to and benefited from. Rather, he was claiming to be the fulfillment and replacement of that system, which would have been fine if he remained small, which would have been fine if he just remained in the small villages and towns of Galilee. But Jesus, he took the show on the road and he went from town to town, village to village, and he spread this message. And everywhere he went, the crowds would gather. And the majority would find him to be irresistible. I want to take you to Luke chapter 5. If you're new to the Bible, first thing to know is it's divided into two parts. There's the Old Testament, which tells the story of ancient Israel. And then there's the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we have 27 books, or a better way to think of it is we have 27 ancient documents written by eight, maybe nine different authors. And the first four are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell the life of Jesus. And we're going to look at gospel, uh, the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. And at this point, Jesus' public ministry has already begun. He's already preached in the synagogue. There's already been one attempt at his life. A crowd gathered and tried to push him off a hill, Luke chapter 4. He's already done some controversial things. He's already got quite the following. And he's having an argument with the Pharisees, with this few that ultimately find him to be intolerable. And he says this. He says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. So this is going to be a metaphor. Jesus is going to talk about one thing in terms of another thing. He says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Well, why not, Jesus? Well, it's really simple. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. Now, in the first century, everybody would have gotten this because they understood that wineskins were made out of animal hide. And when it was new, the wineskin had an elasticity to it. It could stretch. It had some flex to it. And new wine, it would be poured into this new wineskin, and the fermentation process of the wine had not been completed. And so there would be gases that would bubble up. And that elasticity of the new wineskin was essential to account for those gases. But if you poured new wine into an old wineskin, which had become brittle, which had become fixed, it had no flex to it, that new wine would burst the wineskin. And Jesus, he's talking about wine to tell us about something else because he would claim that his ministry, that his message was new wine that would require new wineskin. If you try to put his message into the old structures, the ways of thinking and the ways of being in the world that was part of Judaism in the first century, that involved a temple where you would go to sacrifice an animal to make it right with God, that involved not just 10 commandments, but 613 commandments and a whole lot of oral tradition on top of that. If you try to pour his new wine into a rule uh, keeping, earning system that was so essential and so prominent in his day and age that the new wine would burst that system and spill out everywhere and make a mess. It wouldn't work. And so Jesus says, no, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And he's saying something to them and he's saying something to us. What he's saying is that this new wine, this new message of God's grace is going to require you to think differently. 
It's going to require you to abandon some of your standard ways of thinking about the world, standard ways of thinking about yourself, standard ways of thinking about God and how justice and everything works. It's going to require a new framework, a new set of lenses for you to be able to receive this new wine. Many of us struggle to receive the gospel of grace that God has done for you what you couldn't possibly do for yourself, that it is a gift by which we are saved. We struggle to receive that because we are still stuck in the old wineskin of I got to earn it. There's got to be some rules somewhere. And so we can't receive it. And Jesus, he's well aware of the resistance to the new wine. He goes on to say, And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Because we get comfortable with a certain way of being in the world. We get comfortable seeing the world in a certain way. And even when that mindset, that way of being in the world, isn't really doing well by us, we still rather hold on to that than go into the unknown and into the new. And so there's always going to be resistance. And Jesus, he came not to just put new wine into old wineskins. He came to bring a whole new way of thinking. And this made him dangerous. This made him intolerable. And ultimately, he was arrested and crucified. And when he was crucified, those crowds and those followers that were so dedicated to him, every one of them abandoned the movement when he was crucified. Not a single one of them was outside the tomb doing the countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Right? Because they they knew Jesus, he predicted that he would die and be resurrected. But none of them believed him. So none of them were there for the resurrection. And the reason that they didn't believe him, and the reason that they abandoned the movement, is the same reason you would and I would. It would have been absolutely disturbing to see Jesus up on a cross. The Romans had perfected this way of killing people that would dare to stand up to the system, the power structures as they were. And so they made it as gruesome and as disturbing as possible. And every one of them left. This is one of the reasons why I find the gospel accounts to be so reliable and convicting because, you know, if you were to write a story about yourself, Would you include your most embarrassing moments? Come on, you don't even include your most embarrassing moments on your Instagram or your Facebook because all your highlight reel. But in the gospel accounts, the disciples, they include one embarrassing moment after the other and they all abandon the movement. But as we talked about last week, 50 days later, they're back. And they're not just back They're back out in public. They're back out in Jerusalem, in the temple. And it's not just a small group. We're told that there's roughly 120 of them out preaching, teaching, engaging people. And people converted. In the first century, not only Jesus was irresistible, but the church was irresistible. And despite mounting pressure and danger, people flocked to the church. People were compelled by the message. But here in the 21st century, as the danger has been decreasing in America, so is the church. The 21st century, the church has become very resistible. Here, here's a, one stat. Uh, this is from Pew Research. They say that almost one quarter of all Americans and one third of those under the age of 35 identify as nuns. What's a nun? A nun is somebody when they're given a survey and they're asked, what is your re- religious affiliation? And, and there's a box for like Catholic and, and Protestant Christian and probably Muslim and Buddhist and, and what have you. And then there's a, a, a box at the bottom that says none. And 25% of our population, 35% of those under 35, check none. And this is rising. It's increasing. There's a growing group of people that rather have no affiliation than be part of the church. And for me, this is deeply personal because I got kids and I got nieces and a nephew and I care about young people. And I also understand that for the church, it has always been about reaching the next generation. Two thirds of the New Testament is the story of reaching the next generation, of Paul going out and reaching the Gentiles. And if the next generations hadn't been reached, we wouldn't be here. And so this is personal for those of us that are followers of Christ. And there's people out there that say that the reason that this is happening 
is because kids these days, they just don't care, they're rotten, that sort of thing. And they're not aware that like every generation says that about kids these days. Others would say that it's because of soccer on Sundays. If we just didn't have anything going on on Sundays, then the churches would be packed. If you spend much time with me, you would know that I have very little tolerance for this kind of perspective, this sort of blame shifting. Because I want to know what happened. And I want to know what about the church needs to change? What about the way that we are expressing our message? What about the ways in which we're engaging next generations needs to change? Because ultimately, we're the ones responsible. And in the first century, when it was very, very dangerous, when you risked your life to be a follower of Jesus, it was irresistible. But here in the 21st century, something happened. And this message series is all about getting at what happened and what might we do differently to deal with that. So we're going to begin to answer that today. This is not the answer. This is part of the answer. And I want to start off by asking you a question. When you read a book, where do you naturally start? How, how many start at the end? Show of hands. Okay, we got a couple of brave souls. All right, all right. Get your hands down. How many of you start in the middle? How many of you start in the beginning? Right? We, we naturally start in the beginning, most of us. And so if you were handed a Bible, you would naturally start here at the beginning, wouldn't you? Which is not a bad place to start. You got that amazing creation story in the beginning. You got Adam and Eve. There's some essential foundational stuff, but here's the deal. You begin to read from the beginning. You might get through Genesis. You might get through Exodus. If you get through Leviticus, gold star for you, you're going to get bogged down in the book of Numbers, and then you're going to be in Deuteronomy, and you're going to be like, haven't I read all this before? Because a lot of the laws are repeated. And, and if you're one of those just persistent people, you might get all the way through the Old Testament, but it's going to be probably months, maybe a year, and then you finally get to Jesus. And it's going to be strange, because where the Old Testament leaves off and where Jesus begins, there's a gap of 400 years. So it's going to feel very different, and you're going to be a bit confused. And perhaps you're smart enough to be able to deal with all that. I believe some people are. But it is a difficult endeavor. Most people get bogged down, and most people get a bit lost. Maybe you're like me, and you grew up in, in an environment where the preacher would get up, or you would read a lectionary, and it went a little bit like this. You got a little bit of Exodus. You got a, a taste of Paul. You got a, little, a taste of the Psalms. You got a little bit of Jesus here, a little bit of Jesus there. You got a little bit of, just keep going. You got a little bit of a bite of Peter. You got a slice of Isaiah. You got some Genesis, and maybe a nibble of Revelation. And it was just a smattering of here, there, and everywhere. And you were told it's all the word of God. And I agree with that. It's all the word of God. But oftentimes, at least how I grew up, the way the story was presented is it's just all over the place. It felt haphazard. And undoubtedly, those that were behind the presentation of that, they had some sense of how it all fit together. But as I was somebody listening to it and hearing it or reading it in a devotional, it just was all over the place. And it gives you this impression that Moses and Jesus are equal. That what Moses said in the Ten Commandments and all that, that, that that's of equal value, equal standing for a Christian as the words of Jesus. Which is why there's been Christians behind putting the Ten Commandments like out in front of courthouses and in schools and that sort of thing. It gives you the impression that David and Paul, that their words are equal. I love the Psalms. But is what Paul says as he's founding the New Testament church the same as what David says? Are they of equal value to us Christians? Or like the book Leviticus is just of equal standing. It's the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a story of the early church. It's the story of how this thing began. The first century church would not have considered everything in our 21st century Bibles to be equal. The first century church, if they had a, tw a 21st century Bible, they didn't, by the way. The New Testament doesn't come into its full formation until the fourth century. But if they got one of our Protestant Bibles, they would not look at it all the same. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews is written by an unknown author. We're not sure who wrote this. 
And it's written to an unknown group of people. Some think that it's written to a group of Hebrew or Jewish Christians in Italy, but we're not sure. But this is an important text. And here's what the writer of Hebrews wants us to know. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on who? Jesus. Let's say it together. On who? Right, it's the right answer anytime you're in Sunday school. Jesus, okay? Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we have acknowledged as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Moses did his job. He was great. Served his purpose. They both were faithful. Jesus has been found worthy of a greater honor than Moses. Just as the builder of a house has a greater honor than the house itself. And so many of us, I know myself, the way I was exposed to the scripture and taught about it, Moses and Jesus, equal standing, all the same. The writer of Hebrews is saying, no, no, no. Jesus is greater than Moses. There's a hierarchy here. They're not on the same plane. Moses was, a, was faithful as a servant in all of God's house bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. He served his purpose in his place and time, but he also bore witness to something that was coming in the future. This is the writer of Hebrews' perspective. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. Moses was in it. Christ is over it. And we are his house. We're not Moses' house. We're Christ's house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence in the hope in which we glory. Are you saying, Pastor Scott, that I shouldn't read the Old Testament? That's not what I'm saying. The Old Testament is incredibly important for us to understand the New Testament and why there needed to be a new covenant. There's great wisdom in the Old Testament. It's a reliable account of God's dealing with a group of people and humanity during a certain historical period. Are you saying that I should obey the Ten Commandments? That is what I'm saying. The Ten Commandments, that was a law given to a certain group of people. Now, mind you, Jesus comes along and he says things like this. He says, you heard it was said that you shall not murder. That's in the Ten Commandments. I say, if you're even angry with somebody, you're in trouble. So it's not that it's just all loosey-goosey. But I am saying that we are Christ's house, not Moses's. It's not haphazard. There's a sequence. The Bible should be read sequentially, not haphazard. Part of the confusion, part of what has made the scripture and this story so resistible is because we've given this haphazard approach. And we Christians find ourselves defending things that we shouldn't even be defending, trying to follow things that weren't even for us in the Old Testament. We are Christ's house, And the Old Testament is powerful and it's relevant in so much as it leads to the New Testament and the teachings of Christ. A better way to look at it is that the Bible is the story of four covenants that led to a fifth and final covenant. That the Bible is organized around these agreements between God and humanity. First the one with Noah, then Abraham, And then the nation of Israel, which is mediated through Moses, that's the Ten Commandments, and then King David. But ultimately, we get a new covenant, a final covenant in the person of Jesus Christ. Next week, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I will stand back here like I've done every month. And when I get ready to pour out the wine, I'll say, this is a sign of the new covenant. Yet we don't talk about it. And I don't know about you, but nobody ever laid it out to me like this. But once I started to understand it, it made a ton of sense. The Bible should be read sequentially, not haphazardly. Because things happen in history, and it was one way before, and now it's different after. October 3rd, 2009, I got married. And it was one way before, and now it's very different after. Anybody with me on that? And I'm glad to be married, but things change in history. God says to Noah, I established my covenant with you. Never again with all life, will all life be destroyed by the waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth because things 
have changed. There's a sequence of events that have occurred in history. When you don't understand that, this is incredibly confusing. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all the living creatures of every kind on earth. Sequential. There is a chain of events. If you don't understand that, and you don't understand the backbone of the scripture, which are these covenants that are all leading to this final one, it's hard to understand what this is about. What's four plus four? What's four plus four? All right, we've got a few people that are awake here. All right, four plus four is eight. And I ask you that question because I want you to remember Hebrews chapter eight, which in terms of covenants is probably the most important part of our New Testament that we never read. At least I never read. And here's what the writer says. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises. When he's talking about the old covenant, he's specifically talking about the covenant with the nation of Israel mediated through the person of Moses, 10 commandments. And he's saying we have a new covenant that is better than that covenant. It's on better promises. It's better, it's superior. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another but God found fault with the people and said, and now he's going to quote Jeremiah 31. So he's going back hundreds of years to quote this ancient prophet. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. Well, tell me about that covenant. When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, remember Moses parting the Red Sea, let my people go, that whole thing. It will not be like the one I made when I led them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. You read the Old Testament. That's basically a summary. It's them failing to remain faithful. They don't care for the poor. In fact, at times they oppress the poor and they worship false gods over and over again. And I turned away from them. Babylonian Empire comes in, 587 BCE, and they are taken off into exile. I turned away from them, declares the Lord, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. They used to be on stone tablets. They used to be in the temple. You used to need to go to a priest in order to hear about these laws. But now they're going to be on your hearts and in your minds. It's going to be accessible to everyone. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. Why? Because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. The greatest being the priests, and the teachers of the law, and the scribes, and all the educated people, but also the least, the children, the teenagers, the uneducated, the outcast. It's going to be accessible to everyone. Well, how is it going to be accessible? For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. You used to have to come to the temple under the old covenant. And you'd have to like take your currency wherever you were from. And you'd exchange it for the currency that was in the temple. The only currency that is allowed. And, and somebody would take a little bit off the top. It was a racket. This is why Jesus turns over the money changes tables. So you'd exchange your currency, and then you'd buy an animal, and you'd pay a bunch of money for it. It'd be some sort of knockoff animal. It'd be like inflated prices, you know? It's kind of like if you go to like a baseball game, and like a pretzel's like $8 and that sort of thing. Everything's inflated. And then you take this animal in, and that animal is killed. And because of the blood of the animal, somehow you are reconciled with God, and that was the old covenant. And it was a way to deal with your guilt. And it sounds barbaric to us, but it was innovative and there was grace to it. But there's better promises now. There's a gospel of grace. And forgiveness is offered to all. Not because you earned it. Not because you paid for it. But because God decided to intervene yet again into history. And establish his new covenant. By calling this covenant new, the writer of Hebrews, now he's, this is his opinion, he's no longer <coughs> quoting. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. That's right. That's one part of your Bible 
call in another part of your Bible obsolete. Say that again. It's one part of your Bible talking about another part of your Bible, calling it obsolete. Some of us were exposed to the Bible in a haphazard way, and we're wondering, how does it all fit together? And God seems so like mean in the Old Testament and so nice with Jesus, and I don't get it. But here we have somebody that understands the sequential nature of the Bible. Let's call it one part obsolete. What is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The new covenant, this is the claim of the first century Christians. This is the claim ultimately of Jesus. The new covenant fulfills, completes, and renders obsolete the previous covenants. This is a big big, big deal. My guess is nobody ever told you. Nobody ever told me. I wish that when I went to seminary, they would have just sat me down and been like, we need to start off by talking about covenants. I'm like, covenants? That sounds boring. I'm like, might be, but it's essential, okay? We need to talk about these agreements because we are people of the new covenant. And that's what's so compelling. That's what's so powerful. That's what's so different. It's new wine. But we don't want to put this in old wineskins because when we do, it just creates a mess and we lose it all. My guess is nobody ever told you this story. That's why the sermon series is titled The Most Important Story You've Never Been Told. If you know this story, then congratulations. Most of us don't. This is from the book that we're reading as a church Andy Stanley is a pastor down in Georgia. I follow his ministry. I think it's quite good. He says in the book, he says, I am convinced that it is the mixing, blending, and integration of the old with the new that makes the modern church so resistible. He is not talking about people. He's talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. Because I am convinced that when older members of the church connect with younger members of the church, when people have been in the church a long time, connect with people that are new to the church, that that makes the church actually quite irresistible. It's one of the most powerful things for us. But what he's talking about is mixing old covenant, blending it in, taking a little bit of Leviticus, a little bit of the Psalms, a little Jesus, a little Peter, throw it in a blender, mix it up and serve it up. And that is what's making this thing so resistible because it's downright confusing And it doesn't take into account the fact that life has a sequence to it and we are people of the new covenant. So the application is just a question for you to think about. What does it mean to be a new covenant people? You might be thinking, what is the new covenant again? And if you're thinking that, come back next week. We'll talk about it more. What does it mean to be a new covenant people? What changes? Because I tell you, uh, it'd be very hard, for instance, to start a war if you're following the New Covenant. It's hard to go to the Sermon on the Mount and find justification for violence and war. Go back to the Old Covenant, go back to Leviticus, and go back to the book of Joshua and some other things in the Old Testament. you got plenty of things that you can find. What is the difference? What does it mean to be a New Covenant person? Because that's what this is in every month since I've been here, and I imagine for years prior to that, somebody has stood behind this table or somewhere and has celebrated communion and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. God, we thank you for all the covenants, all the agreements that you've made with humanity and with people. But we're most grateful for the new covenant, the fifth and final covenant that you make through our Lord Jesus Christ that tells us that you are a God of grace, that the agreement is is that we just need to believe you and surrender our egos so that we can receive this great gift. And in doing so, this gift changes us And changing us, we become part of your plan to change the world. So God, I pray that each person here, that their curiosity would be heightened, that something in this message would connect, that they would begin to wonder and imagine that there is a way 
that is irresistible. There is a message that is so compelling that people would even risk their lives for it and that we can recapture that message. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.